I would like to start by saying, and it's an honor tonight to be speaking to you from the traditional ancestral territory of the Anishinaabe people and the Huron Wendat before them. And this territory is home to proud First Nations and Metis people. And we recognize and thank all the generation of peoples who've taken care of this land and the water for thousands of years before us. So thank you again for joining us. I'm uh, Julie Cayley, for those of you who don't know me, I'm the executive director of the Severin Sound Environmental Association. Um, I am also a professional agrologist, so um, I was happy when uh, Soil and Crop recognized both the CCAs and the PAGs for this, and that's the invitations went to both tonight. Um, a bit of housekeeping to start with, I am going to ask people to mute their microphones. I'm sorry, I should have asked for that right off the bat. Um, and you're welcome to have your cameras on or off, whatever you're most comfortable with, but we do ask that you uh, mute your microphones for the presentation itself. But again, up to you, on or off for your camera. Now, next slide, please, Melissa. So what tonight isn't going to be is a lesson on soil health, because we know that that's what all of you work in and your expertise is in. So what we're really hoping to do tonight is connect those of you that are soil experts, the CCAs and the PAGs, and obviously the, the farmers that are on the call, with water experts. So those of us at Severin Sound, the folks at Lake Simcoe Region Conservation Authority and the Nottawasaga Valley Conservation Authority. And I also should have mentioned, sorry, Tracy Ryan from the Soil and Crop, Ontario Soil and Crop um, as well. So we're hoping to make some of those connections um, and make them strong so that we can all work together moving this forward to make sure that the resources that are available um, are used as much as possible. And uh, that's the other hope we're, we have for this is that particularly as CCAs and PAGs that this is going to give you more information on programs and opportunities and cost share available that you can then share with your clients and farmers that you know where you're working with. Next slide, please. You've all seen the agenda, I hope. Um, I've already warned our speakers. I'm going to try to keep us to a pretty tight timeline so that uh, uh, folks aren't, aren't on for too long tonight. I know uh, it's important to, uh, to be able to get to other things and probably a lot of you have just come out of the field or are not, maybe not even out of the field yet um, and uh, are probably looking forward to some dinner at some point. Next slide, please. And we're really speaking to this boundary that's on the map, right? So if you, the red boundary is Simcoe County and I know Tracy's program applies beyond that, but for this call, that's who we targeted was uh, the CCA PAG community within this boundary. What you also will, will note in uh, this slide are the watershed boundary areas. So when, for instance, the SSCA person, Morgan speaks to his program, it's specific to that watershed. Um, when Shannon speaks to the Nottawasaga Valley program, you can see specific to that program as well. Um, and I'm sorry, is it Robert? I am so sorry, I just managed to, yep. Um, from Lake Simcoe speaks to his program. That's, uh, you can see that watershed there. So a significant, uh, significant area that we're all covering and we just wanted to come together and share as much as we could with you all in one place. Sorry, Peter. I'm sorry, Peter. It's kind of like Robert, only it's not. So Peter. And I've not met Peter before, so I'm excited to meet Peter. Um, and uh, next slide, please. I think we're going to launch right in. And Tracy, um, I think we'll stop sharing. And if you'd like to share, uh, we're happy to have Tracy Ryan from the Ontario Soil and Crop Improvement Association, um, a past uh, conservation authority person as well, and someone who's worked uh, for quite some time on cost share and agriculture a best management practice programming and that's how Tracy and I met was uh, let's just say it was a couple years ago in some uh, ag non-point source work uh, through the province so Tracy take it away. Great thank you and Julie um, am I good you can see this the yeah. I shared the screen great yeah. well thank you uh, really appreciate um, the invitation and um, and I'm going to yes as I said I'm used to be involved with conservation authorities and I'm, I'm very pleased to be part of Ontario Soil and Crop Improvement Association now. Um, I'm going to talk to you about a, a new program that we've just um, launched. It's called Accelerate Your Soil Health Game. And um, it's the pilot project with the funding and um, utilizing expert coaches is available in three counties as a pilot. So Lambton, Simcoe and Renfrew. 
Um, a number of the resources, though, that I'll speak to um, at the end of the uh, presentation are available on the website and um, add to that sort of body of knowledge that Julie was talking about. So <clears throat> hopefully um, they will have um, a, a little broader um, application. So the Reducing Barriers to BMP Adoption is a project um, that has been funded since 2020 and will end in 2023. And it is funded through the Canada Agricultural Partnership, which is a five-year federal, provincial, territorial initiative. And the Ontario Soil and Crop Improvement Association is delivering the project on behalf of the Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. The project looked at, uh, did a number of, of um, research studies, uh, literature review, reviewed programs, past programs, and also ran some focus groups and surveys, and uh, basically to understand what the barriers were to the adoption of soil testing and cover crop. And it won't be surprising to any who have worked in, in the best management field, um, but basically producers were unaware of soil testing programs, so those funding programs that are available that we're all going to talk about today. and. Um, and there was some, some wondering whether any of them were useful, actually. CCAs and soil testing labs also were generally unaware of any of the programs that were available. There was a lack of clear messaging, so a high degree of confusion on where to find funding. And also there was the perception that there was often too much paperwork, there was an administrative burden, and funding timelines and limitations often were a problem. So, this pilot pro project is out to address some of that, and um, we developed, had an advisory team of which uh, one of the members of the advisory team is on the call, Andy Van Niekirk, and uh, they looked at the research that had been done and the barriers that had been identified and came up with guiding principles for a program. Basically, it had to involve both cover crops and soil testing, because that's what OMAFRA wanted us to look at. Um, but the committee said, the advisory team said, the farmers need to be able to opt into either of those, so we weren't going to limit them to just one of them. Um, the other thing that came up a lot was people who had already, the early adopters, who had already been doing some soil testing or cover crops, are usually shut out of these programs and therefore trying new things was not possible. So we wanted to include some of those things in there. So you'll see when I discuss which things we will fund, um, you'll see that even if you've done a cover crop or uh, have soil tested, we're kind of um, encouraging you to, as we say, accelerate your soil health game. We wanted to address access to information barriers, wanted to simplify the paperwork, and of course, again, OMAFRA wanted us to um, pilot it in three areas. So the Accelerate Your Soil Health pilot project um, offers a cost share in Simcoe County, since that's who, what we're talking about today, of 60% up to $2,500 per project. And that can be a cover crop or soil test, or a producer could opt into both of those streams. We have a simplified application and eligibility, so um, I'll discuss that. The purpose is to encourage farmers who have not soil tested or used cover crops, but also, as I've, no as I've noted, to encourage new practices so that any producer could accelerate their soil health game. The other thing that the program does is provide free local advice and assistance. So that's where um, CCAs and PAGs come into the, the picture. Um, and that we've created an expert coach approach. Uh, the other thing was creating a one-stop shop to access Ontario information and funding sources. So again, even though um, the pilot project's not eligible elsewhere, other producers can access that information or information on funding. And as we move through this, we are going to be evaluating the process and looking at what's working and what's not working. So, when someone applies to the project, um, they're paired with an expert coach, that can be a CCA or a PAG, um, to provide advice, assist with project design and implementation, as well as completing the paperwork. The expert coaches are expected to provide two coaching sessions 
uh, anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour of each session with each participant that they coach. And um, the key is that those are provided as part of the program. So those aren't a billable item for the, the CCA or PAG. That's going to be paid for by OSCIA as part of this expert coach approach. Um, and then again, as I mentioned, there's the information online. So CCAs or PAGs looking to, who are interested in being an expert coach can go onto our website and um, register to be an expert coach. And then um, we just ran one orientation session last, or last week, I guess that was Tuesday night, seems like last week. And um, I think there were a couple of people who were on this call at that orientation session. So what is eligible? Um, so if someone is soil sampling a field for the first time since 2016, they can soil sample by any method. So it could be bulk, grid, zone, or another smart technology. And the minimum analysis has to be the basic package from an OMAFRA accredited lab. But for those people who do soil sample more regularly, um, CCAs and PAGs can encourage them then to up their game, so to speak, and uh, maybe move into grid, zone, or other smart technologies, and to maybe add a few things onto that basic analysis. So they're improving their, their information that they're getting. Cover crops, again, under the basic, if they're trying cover crops for the first time, it's plant an overwintering cover crop. That's about it. Um, winter wheat and alfalfa are not eligible. But if somebody wants to up their game, and I mean, even if they've never tried it, they could do one of these as well, plant a new type of cover crop, which would be in, for grazing, um, diversifying their mix, interseeding, we're a bit late for that, unfortunately, and um, winter cereal. So they could include rye, triticale, barley, or canola. So again, you'll see, unlike many cover crop programs, this one is saying, sure, graze it, take it off as forage, or you know, if it's a marketable um, item, then that's great. The point is having cover in the winter. The simplified application, it's I think two, well, aside from the declaration that's required, um, it's two pages long, no EFP is required. Um, limited, Limited information, um, no project details required for the pre-approval stage, automatic pre-approval at 60% up to the maximum. Um, it's not through the portal. Um, it is just a fillable PDF online that can be emailed then. And um, the next stage to get them to full application is where the expert coach does the work and, and provides the details on the next um, side. And Julie's going to cut me off shortly. So the role of the expert coach is really supporting um, the producer, helping them evaluate the project, uh, troubleshooting, providing local advice, um, getting them in touch with others if they need to, and, and helping them with the paperwork. Uh, the coaching sessions um, are pretty, again, geared towards those goals. So it, the first one has to occur before September 30th so that um, the details are in and the, the funding is allocated. And then the second meeting can occur anytime after the first one, but must be done by December 10th. And basically, um, I won't uh, take you to the landing page at this point for this, but it is on Ontario Soil Crop Improvement Association's website, Accelerate Your Soil Health Game. There are a number of different um, resources there as well for the CCAs and PAGs who are on this call. If you're interested in um, registering, please do. We would be uh, happy to have a few more in Simcoe. It's a very short timeline. We launched it April 30th. Um, our intake runs through the summer uh, and um, the pilot really does conclude at the end of December and we will have an evaluation then done at the beginning of 2022. So. That's it. Thank you, Tracy. Well done. You had like 15 seconds left. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, and uh, we're going to hold questions till the end. Hopefully that's okay with everyone. So we can uh, have our other speakers run through then what's available on a more watershed basis. So from uh, the three different watersheds we spoke to at the beginning, for those of you who've just joined us, 
Um, if you weren't muted, I muted you. Hopefully that's all right with you. Just an FYI, we are recording, so um, that's something you need to know. And uh, it will be available to folks who haven't obviously then been able to join us as well. And uh, I just have to say, Tracy, the expert coach idea, particularly when you mentioned um, helping with paperwork has been a conversation several of us have been having. So good to know that somebody else will be doing the paperwork for folks. Um, so the next speaker we have is Morgan Gillies and Melissa Carruthers. So both from Severn Sound Environmental Association. And uh, I'm not going to be any easier on you two. Um, for the 10 minutes. So take it away. Thank you very much, Julie. So I'm going to start it off here. So uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, before I pass it over to Morgan, I just wanted to quickly give you a bit of context into where Severn Sound is and who exactly is the Severn Sound Environmental Association. So Severn Sound is a collection of bays. It's located in the southeastern portion of Georgian Bay on Lake Huron. Uh, it's in the north and northern portion of Simcoe County. And just for a bit of context, uh, we're located about an hour and a half north of Toronto. Uh, the Severn Sound Environmental Association are also known as the SSEA, so I'll probably just say that for short. Uh, we're a watershed-based organization. Uh, the watershed is approximately a thousand square kilometers in size. We're located in the transition zone between the Precambrian Shield and sedimentary bedrock, so we're a bit of a unique um, area. And the area is a mix of farmland, forest cover, rural and urban areas, and it consists of nine municipalities, so they're primarily in the county of Simcoe, uh, with a small portion in the district municipality of Muskoka. So since 2009, we've operated as a joint municipal service board under the Municipal Act, and we are primarily non-regulatory except for duties as source protection authority under the Clean Water Act. Uh, our roots span from once being one of 17 Canadian Great Lakes areas of concern uh, due to degraded water quality. We have since delisted, so we're one of three to do so on the Canadian side, uh, and that was done with much help from the agricultural community, so we do thank them for that as well. Uh, today we continue to work to monitor and preserve the beneficial uses of Severn Sound for both uh, current and future generations. And just keep an eye on this, uh, this section right here. So I just want to point your attention to a study area on the map. This is the area uh, where the SSCA will be piloting the Healthy Soils, Healthy Watershed program. Uh, and I'll get to the reason why we're choosing this area in just a moment. Before I get to that, uh, I can't really see a lot of you, so um, uh, maybe just for some context, uh, for those of you who have not heard of the Drinking Water Source Protection Program before, uh, it is a, a provincial program. Uh, the, the overall goal is to protect municipal drinking water sources from overuse and contamination. Uh, it does get its power from the Clean Water Act, which is provincial legislation, and it's the first step in Ontario's multi-barrier approach to protecting municipal drinking water sources. So although it's provincial legislation, it's uh, being rolled out uh, locally through local source protection areas and regions uh, and e in each of those regions we have a local source protection plan. So that plan it contains policies, it dictates how we handle various activities on the landscape and who does that. Uh, so in Simcoe County we're primarily located in the South Georgian Bay Lake Simcoe source protection uh, region. The program applies in vulnerable areas. So these are in wellhead protection areas. So those are areas around municipal wells or intake protection zones, which are um, surface water. Uh, and the reason I'm mentioning all of this is the map on the bottom of your screen. It's got a, an area in green. Uh, in this particular municipal system, there's a known, um, there's a nitrate issue. So they have elevated nitrates. Uh, the township is working very hard. Uh, they are blending water. So it, the water is safe for consumption. Um, but there is a known uh, nitrate issue. It's also an area that based on those source protection plan policies, I'm dealing with a group of farmers in this area. Uh, I'm helping to negotiate field level plans uh, just to confirm that they're not uh, putting the municipal systems at risk. Um, so we thought based on our, our program, this was a good area to start. You know, we're already kind of in communications. It's, it's a way for us to help out those farmers where, you know, I have to go to them from a regulatory standpoint, but maybe being offered to, being able to offer a stewardship type program uh, would help out a bit more. And so with that, I'm going to pass it over to Morgan to talk more about the Healthy Soils, Healthy Watershed program. Great. Thank you, Melissa. Um, so as Melissa uh, mentioned, I'm the new program coordinator for our Healthy Soils equals Healthy Watersheds program. Um, we do have a limited kind of budget. So as uh, we're just focusing on that area of concern. So Part of that is engaging with those local farmers in that area of concern. Um, and then we're meeting with them to uh, kind of engage and talk with them to identify different areas, in which case we can implement OMAFRA standard best management practices. 
And then once we kind of have those pilot projects going, uh, we want to distribute those findings that we have and resources we've collected with uh, other local um, farmers in our watershed um, to sh through uh, our social media posts as well as our websites. Um, so if you go next slide, please. So uh, we do have a low budget this year, so we're more focusing on uh, one BMP is enhanced soil sampling to assist our farmers. So uh, we have a GIS department at the SSEA. So one way it helps us find a good way to uh, segregate the kind of different zones uh, of a farmer's field based off of topography and water drainage layers. So as well as uh, we have our summer staff who can go out and physically take the soil sample course for our farmers itself, because we know it does take a lot of time to uh, collect all those sample cores. So anyway, we can help our farmers um, collect more samples so that they can have enhanced data about their fields and make uh, better decisions is great for us. And this is where we really would like to work with our CCAs and PAGs in the local community because we can help uh, get the farmers the data, but we can't really do much in terms of the recommendations. So that's where we need to pass the baton on to our local CCAs and PAGs so that they can make the appropriate recommendations for fertilizer uses for our farmers. And then if you want to go one more, next slide. So um, generally speaking, our grant is going to focus more on soil sampling. Um, so that uh, we can implement the proper cover crops uh, for this fall for winter cover crops. So as you can see, to assist with that, we are going to purchase two soil augers so that we can lend out uh, for assistance in collecting the sample cores. We also have a grant um, that will cover 50% of the analysis cost for uh, the soil samples. We will also have a grant that covers 50 to 75% of uh, advice from a certified crop advisor or professional agrologist. Uh, and this will be able to be partnered up with the Ontario Soil and Crop uh, grant as well. And then finally, we have a grant um, to cover the cost of the cover crop seeds up to 50% of that. Um, so like I said, we, it's a very small project area. So we're kind of focusing on this specific BMPs. Um, but in the future, we would hopefully like to implement other things uh, such as what the LSRCA and the MVCA are going to offer. So hopefully, I'm excited to see what they have to present and hopefully one day we can have our program like theirs as well. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Morgan. Um, next, we're going to ask Peter, who I am going to choose to call Robert, I think. No, I'm not. Peter, I'll use your real name. And um, to speak to us about what programs you have available from the Lake Simcoe Region Conservation Authority in your watershed. Take it away, Peter. Sure, thank you. Uh, just trying to share my screen here. All right. So, uh, here is quick overview of our, uh, our funding program. So, uh, as mentioned, my name is Peter Shuttleworth, sometimes go by Robert. Uh, I'm a restoration project specialist with the Lake Simcoe Region Conservation Authority. Uh, and I'd like to provide uh, a brief overview of the funding program that we have, uh, specifically geared towards farmers. Uh, and I'll give a short explanation of how funding works. So uh, before I get started, uh, an overview of our uh, watershed boundaries. As far as Simcoe County is concerned, uh, it's only a sliver of our jurisdiction uh, on the uh, west side of Lake Simcoe, uh, going from Tecumseh up to Aurelia. So, uh, LSRCA offers uh, funding grants to farmers uh, in a variety of categories. Um, and the funding grants are aimed to protect soil and water resources. Uh, it's easy to apply. All of the information is available online at uh, lsrca.on.ca slash funding. Uh, one part of the program is that we do offer free confidential site visits 
uh, so it gives us a chance to uh, see the current situation, uh, meet with the, the farmers, and uh, and discuss their ideas for for projects. Uh, here is a list of the, uh, the funding categories that we offer, as well as the funding caps. Uh, the funding categories that are highlighted here are the ones geared towards uh, agricultural projects. Uh, you'll notice down below uh, in bold, I do have planting trees and shrubs highlighted, uh, and that's because uh, that offers programs such as uh, planting of windbreaks that uh, might be attractive to farmers. So one of the cover, uh, one of the uh, programs I'd like to uh, discuss is our cover cropping. This is uh, one of our more popular programs. We've been doing this for a few years, uh, and the aim of this is to uh, provide funding for uh, non-economic cover crops. Uh, so, cover crops obviously uh, quite important for a number of reasons. Uh, mainly with uh, protecting soil, conserving the soil uh, on the farm rather than uh, letting it be open to wind and water erosion. Uh, funding for this program is available uh, at 100% up to $2,000 and that covers the cost of seed for, uh, for the cover cropping. We also offer funding for uh, farm soil and nutrient management planning. So this covers the cost of soil testing and analysis by accredited agencies, uh, as well as nutrient management plans and strategies uh, approved by OMAFRA. Uh, funding for this program is uh, $500 for the nutrient management planning up to $1,000 if it's combined with other projects. Uh, so we do offer funding for uh, uh, managing manure and managing milkhouse waste. So if one of those projects is, is a part of it, uh, then the, the funding is increased uh, and added to the, uh, the amount available for, uh, for the manure storage or the milkhouse waste. And uh, as well, cropland, controlling cropland erosion. So this is for a variety of projects, uh, grass waterways, water and sediment control basins, or, or wascobs, terraces, drop structures. Uh, this can be uh, uh, geared to this specific situation and we are open to, uh, to other suggestions uh, as long as it fits the, uh, the purpose of the category. Uh, this has been used uh, quite a few times on uh, a variety of properties around the, the watershed, uh, not, not only to improve conditions on the farm, but also to protect our waterways and, and Lake Simcoe itself uh, by controlling uh, sedimentation and nutrient inputs. Uh, just so you know, there are a number of projects or a number of funding categories that we have that are geared specifically to uh, marsh farmers. Uh, are in a more of a unique situation. So uh, we do offer funding for de equipment uh, and um, uh, tile outlet control. And funding for controlling cropland erosion, 50% up to 5,000. Thank you, Peter. Hey, um, I can see Morgan getting jealous in the corner with the just the short list of things that you went through there. So thank you very much. Um, next up, we are going to hear from Shannon from Nottawasaga Valley Conservation Authority. Shannon, if you want to share your slide deck, um, and then when Shannon's done, we're gonna um, we're gonna have some Q and A's, and I've already got one, so I um, I'm hoping I get to go first, but maybe not. Melissa might tell me no, but. Uh, As soon as you're ready and you unmute, Shannon, you're good to go. 
All right, can everybody hear me? Thumbs up, Melissa. Lovely. Um, thank you everyone for being here and uh, spending your time uh, tonight to, to share this with us. I know um, I really value you taking the time out of your schedule to do that. I've been with the Nottawasaga Valley Conservation Authority for about 15 years, working with uh, the agricultural and rural stewardship programs. And I'm so appreciative of all the enthusiastic landowners I've met during that time and um, want to share some of the project funding we have. Uh, keep in mind, this is always a very fluid thing. So if you have a project that doesn't fit, share it with me. Um, I do keep a record and uh, I, I do try to actively go and um, try to find funding for those projects as they accumulate. Um, but I'll share some of the ones that we have more consistent funding with now. So uh, the Nottawasaga Valley, we're uh, a fairly large watershed. We're uh, 3,700 square kilometers uh, just uh, north of Toronto. And we have 18 member municipalities, parts of three counties, including Simcoe County, which uh, Tracy has shared this new great program around encouraging soil health. So I'm really excited about that. Um, but if you don't happen to uh, live in Simcoe County or you have farmers that you're serving in Gray or Dufferin County, um, uh, some of the programs I'll share with you uh, may apply to those uh, farmers. And it's a beautiful watershed. Uh, these are just some of the shots from the river and people enjoying it. And um, I'm really grateful to live here. And so are many people and our headwaters are up in the Niagara Escarpment and the Oak Ridges Moraine and the Oro Moraine, which is north of Barrie, which are kind of glacial features. And they drain down into Wasaga Beach, which is a really important tourism attraction. And you see these people pre-COVID, of course, <laughs> enjoying this wonderful day. Uh, but it contributes about a billion dollars to the economy. Um, and that was in 2007, so I'm sure if I ran the inflation, it would be about a billion point three or, or something now. So how we manage the land really has impacts beyond our own properties. Why stewardship? So I've actually been an environmental officer with MOE. Um, I vastly prefer the voluntary projects, and I think we can get further with them because they are voluntary. Um, and, and stewardship is this idea of like caring for the land and water, recognizing you're kind of a temporary holder of this and you want to leave it in a better spot than what you got it as. And the reason we need to do this, despite the fact that the watershed is beautiful, is that we have issues <laughs> and you'd have to be blind these days to not recognize that you have some of those issues. So around bacteria and pollution and various things. One of the particular ones in our watershed is too much nutrients, too much of a good, good thing. As I say, I love chocolate cake. Too much chocolate cake is a bad thing. <laughs> Just like too much phosphorus in, in the case of our watershed, although a necessary nutrient for life, when it ends up in our rivers and lakes, it's a limiting nutrient in freshwater systems. And about a kilogram could grow up to about a half a ton of algae. And so if we can, uh, if we can limit that runoff off the landscape, um, it really makes a huge difference in not seeing some of these big water quality issues. And we have to cut that runoff by about half just to make the provincial water quality objectives and get down to those limits. And we're re-seeing with warmer climates and bigger storm systems, we're seeing some of these issues we saw in the 70s around Lake Erie experiencing phosphorus blooms, Lake Huron, you can see the satellite fish photos, and even the bottom part of Lake Huron where we live, Georgian Bay, our offshore uh, things, we're starting to see that. And even in my own watershed, we have parts of our river systems that are anoxic, which means there is zero oxygen in the summer months, which as a biologist, that is a really scary thing to see a river system hit an anoxic value. Uh, it's much more common in a lake system 
uh, to see it in a river system where you have a lot of mixing, really terrible sign. Um, where it's coming from, and it's, it's basically in our watershed, we are a really lovely agricultural watershed. We've got a lot of forests and farm, and because of that, most of the phosphorus is actually coming from farm properties where we have disturbed soils. I've worked in more urban watersheds where mo there's a more even split between urban and rural. Um, so it's not surprising to me at all because we live in a very agricultural watershed to see a lot of it's coming from farm, a lot of it from cropland. And this is where soil health programs get me really excited because we get to try to address some of that and it's not good for just the water quality. It's really good for the sustainability of farmland because phosphorus is really highly attached to soil. And basically the fact we're seeing it in our rivers and lakes means that we're losing about 37 tons to our water systems of really good phos, like really good topsoil that could grow crops and feed the world. So to have the water quality issue is almost like a, a sort of conjoint problem of not being able to have sustainable agriculture. So fixing both of those things is really important. And again, to meet the reduction, we've got to kind of cut that in about half. Water quality issues beyond phosphorus, we do have um, a lot of fecal bacteria problems particular after storm events. That's not too unusual in Southern Ontario, um, as well as a lot of sediment loss. And we use benthic invertebrates and we see, um, which are basically the aquatic insects, which uh, show us how river systems are doing over time, because unlike a lake, river systems, the water quality is moving through. And if you want to get a feeling for whether you've had a bad event, you have to track things that live in that river system over a lot of time. So our river systems, very mixed, uh, but where, where we get that confluence of the rivers, we're seeing a lot of poor, poor results. Now, how do we fix that? 96%, I, I would love to be able to fix this in CA owned lands. I have a lot of control over those and I could convince my boss to do anything. <laughs> but 96% in the watershed where a lot of this, this trouble is coming from is privately owned. So it's a joint problem. And if we want to solve it, we have to solve it jointly. Um, so why stewardship? Why do we want to go with a carrot instead of a stick? Um, I feel for the most part, it works a lot better. Like a lot of the things around industrial waste and stuff, we just legislated it. We, with detergents, we said, you can't make detergents that have this much phosphorus or you can't admit this much pollutants. But for non-point sources, that's a trickier thing to legislate. Now there are gonna be people where the carrot doesn't work <laughs> and they're not gonna respond. Um, but, and that's where you start to get laws. If you can't get people to work together for the joint interests of the community, then you start to have to have regulations and you kind of go to the lowest common denominator. And I've, I've done that work and I, I find the work around voluntary uh, stewardship much more rewarding. And I feel like in the best case scenarios, we get a lot farther. So some of the things we offer in our stewardship programs, some of our longest standing are the forestry program. Since 1964, we've offered tree planting. And if you have a landowner or you yourself are a landowner, we offer professional tree planting. If it's beyond two and a half acres, includes things like windbreaks that in can increase crop yields, um, as well as if you need to have uh, sort of break up your field length so you're not having a lot of erosion lengths along a, lo a higher slope field uh, because that can increase your soil loss. We offer off also offer forest management plans. This year's a classic case where we're getting a big gypsy moth outbreak. 
knowing what to do when you have those sort of issues around force management in your plan is quite helpful. So having a professional advice there is useful. Uh, Rick Grill Myers or Forster, you can always call him up for advice if you're in our watershed. If you're below that two and a half acres, we offer a lot of plantings that will recruit volunteers or will provide funding to the landowner if they want to plant themselves, particularly along streams and wetlands. Shannon, you're out of Why we do Shannon, if you could wrap it up, you're you're at your 10 minutes. Okay. <laughs> Why we do this? Um, there was a lot of erosion, massive in the 1930s. I'm going to quickly go into our Healthy Waters program, um, offer free site visits, uh, lots of um, different types of grants, and we've mentioned them like very similar to the LSRCA programs, and um, look them up on our, our website. And I, I can chat with you. The best thing is to come to me. If you're a local contractor, I'd love to list you within our local Green Pages directory. Uh, we have a listing of certified crop advisors in our watershed. And it's very simple. Call. We have grants for the eligible projects between 30 and 100%. And I'll do a site visit, send in the application, wait for your approval letter. I try to turn them around within a week, complete your project, and the grant comes to you within about two to four weeks. So <laughs> I, I have dra dramatically abbreviated this, but I apologize. I, I go off on tangents a bit. <laughs> well, we know you're passionate about what you do, Shannon. So that's the landowners you work with are lucky to have you. So thank you for that. Um, and so um, I think on that note, we're going to, um, I, I just, first thing I want to mention is some of the pieces that I've heard going through these presentations that I just, I want to highlight before we get into the Q&A period. One, um, that there's obviously some cost share money out there available, um, and it's different in the different watersheds, but um, you've got three amazing people, four actually on this call, I'm going to say, working with watershed-based organizations, um, and then a fifth who's with the provincial organization who I think now know enough about each other that if we think we can help refer you to somebody else, please don't worry about calling the wrong person. We'll make sure that you get connected. Um, so, you know, please, uh, if, you, if you could, after the call, if you haven't RSVP'd already, maybe flip Morgan a quick email, um, giving him your contact information. And if there's anything else information-wise that you'd like, um, and uh, any materials from this call or from of the individual speakers and uh, you're not sure how to contact them yourself, we'll make sure that we share those contacts uh, with you. And um, the other thing is that it's obvious there's a bunch of uh, free confidential site visit uh, folks out there available to help you work with um, soil health type situations and obviously a bunch of other uh, cost share as well, um, as well as for, uh, for a bunch of us, what's important to hear is that it sounds like everybody here is willing to help you with paperwork, um, particularly for the cost share and the grant type programs. Um, so I'm with that, Melissa, maybe if we drop that so we can see each other's faces and uh, Melissa and I are gonna try to help facilitate with the questions. So um, if you can maybe use the hand up button at the bottom or just put your hand up and we'll try to watch for you. Um, but I'm going to take the advantage of the fact that I don't breathe when I talk and I'm going to ask the first question and I'm going to ask Tracy. Um, so Tracy, one of the things that I was thinking of while everybody was talking was all of the different money that's available and that could get a bit confusing. So um, would people be able to, if they got, for instance, 50% from one organization, can they, can they top up from you? Can they stack the grants? Is there a rule about uh, the total amount of money that somebody can access through your program or our combined programs? Good question, Julie. And that's 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 a common question. And, and the common rule is generally um, that you can stack programs. I mean, I would defer then to Peter and, and, and Shannon as to whether theirs could be stacked, but I would think they could. And basically, it's just on your claim form that you have to sign off that yes, I'm receiving other funds and I will not exceed 100%. Great, that's good news. Great, thank you.
I will stop hogging the mic. Does anybody else on the call have a question that they'd like to ask? I have a question. Absolutely, Laura. Okay, um, it's related to Shannon Stevens' um, presentation when she had mentioned um, on the pie graph, there was the hay and pasture that was contributing to 7% of the phosphorus and cropland was the majority at 69%. I was wondering what time of year these values were taken. Like, was it at planting time or in the fall or spring? Yeah, so this is actually something I did my master's on around modeling phosphorus runoff from from agricultural fields in the watershed. Um, and honestly, it's it's usually in those uncovered seasons, like it's the winter melts, it's the time before the soil is covered with crops. And you might have five to 10 storms in the year contributing about 90% of your phosphorus load. And so it's it's like, it's a very small period where it really has a huge impact on the water quality of your rivers and lakes. Thank you. Okay. Did that answer your question or? Um, kinda, like I understand that the storm events definitely play an impact, but I mean, for a farmer trying to keep his soil covered, does all the right things, are we still, getting to the point of that 69% being an issue or is this where no farmers were participating with any cover crop use? No, and this is a watershed wide sort of monitoring and it looks at, um, it looks at sort of information research from Ontario, but also from the whole world. Like, so where it is, is like, if you're a farmer and you have a cover crop, this is why soil health is so important. Um, because if you can have a cover crop or residual um, left on your soil or you're having reduced tillage, that, that sort of thing during an event uh, like a spring melt or an early uh, storm event in the spring where you have exposed soil, um, that really reduces the amount of phosphorus. So those kind of actions absolutely reduce the amount that cropland contributes. So if you're a farmer and you're trying to reduce that load and, and, and be a part of that kind of solution, um, things like having a cover crop are super, super important. Um, and it's also something that helps improve your own yield. So it's, it's a great thing, it improves your drought resistance, organic matter, it's definitely a win-win, <laughs> so. Okay, thank you. Shannon, I, I'm thinking there's a question or two questions here in the chat and they may be directed to you. Um, it may be similar slide that this, that this person's referring to the, what were the 1% points, <laughs> what were the 12% groundwater sources? So the 1% point sources are largely the sewage treatment plants in our watershed. Um, so things like Alliston and, and they, it's important to remember that these are legislated things. They have reduced their phosphorus because they are told to reduce it and continuously told to reduce the amount of phosphorus that's coming out of their cities. And they have to meet that or they're ordered to, ordered to meet it. And I, I've actually inspected a lot of sewage treatment plants although in the Hamilton district and issued some of those orders <laughs> to, to make sure they're meeting those. Um, so, but the, the good news is that actually dropped a lot of Ontario's phosphorus con contribution. Um, and that's why some of the things like in the 1960s and 70s, they were declaring Lake Erie dead and we attacked some of those kind of easy to get to point sources and Lake Erie came alive again when the phosphorus reduction was, was there. Um, so the 1% is that groundwater sources is, phosphorus is a natural, natural chemical in the environment. So there's gonna be some natural ambient phosphorus that's just out there and is gonna leach through the system. 
Now, some of that groundwater sources um, can be accelerated if you have excessive nutrient application to things like crop fields or urban areas because people are fertilizing their lawns or, or golf courses. Um, so anything that's highly mobile as a phosphorus source. Um, most phosphorus in its natural form is fairly sticky, um, but some of it is fairly mobile. So it's, it's a tricky chemical. Generally, phosphorus is not super mobile. Um, so that's why buffers work well uh, to, to ameliorate some of the impacts. Great, thank you. Any questions, um, other questions for other, the other, any of our other speakers or about some of the program stuff they've talked about or what you might be telling clients when you're out there working with them or? Andy, I felt like I saw you trying to turn your mute off, but then I wasn't sure if that was maybe your chair was going backwards at a high rate of speed. That's right. <laughs> just, uh, just my chair. All righty. All right. Well, if there's no more questions, um, maybe I'll ask Melissa if she could put up uh, just the, we're going to share that last slide so that folks, if you don't have the right contact information for the people that spoke tonight, um, we will make sure, uh, Morgan will make sure we'll do a follow-up to this and provide all of that information to you. Um, and yes, Tracy's email does have a T at the front. It's a slightly different color, but um, we will make sure that all comes uh, to you. We'll share that with you. We will also, as we mentioned, we've been recording uh, the video and uh, we will make sure that that's available to you as well. And um, I see Tracy's raised her hand. Tracy. Thanks, Julie. Well, I wanted to thank you for um, for Severn Sound Environmental Association for organizing this um, event that it's been great. And I'm, I know it's it's really great when people share what's available, because as as I said, one of the things that we heard was that um, understanding where to find funding and, um, is often a, um, one of the barriers that people have. Um, so it's great to, to see this. And of course, I, I, I would be remiss in saying um, OSCA has other sources of funding, which people are probably very familiar with when the intakes open. Um, they go very quickly as opposed to um, the um, pilot project where we're, we're doing things a little differently. The one thing I forgot to mention is, um, like I said, we're still looking for expert coaches, CCAs and PAGs in Simcoe. And um, it does pay, I forgot, I, I don't think I mentioned that, that for um, every successful applicant that you coach, um, once you're registered and, and oriented, um, when the project's completed, it's $350. So just in case you thought it was, um, there, you were doing the paperwork for nothing. So just wanted to mention that. Thanks. Thank you. So if you haven't registered and you're a CCA or a PAG and um, you want to get trained up so that you can uh, be reimbursed for some of this work, and we'd love to have as many of you as possible uh, doing this. I want to thank you all for participating and taking your time tonight. We know that you're all busy, um, regardless of the role you're taking on the landscape right now. So thank you again. And um, hopefully now you've got some contacts to use if you have any more questions. And um, everybody take care and have a good evening.